Well, I want to thank our worship teams and everybody for leading us so far. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever read The Capital of the World by Ernest Hemingway? Right? It's a short story that revolves around a father and his teenage son whose name was Paco. It was set in Spain. Paco is an extremely common name at the time, and with uh, desires in his heart to become a matador, young Paco uh, leaves his father, and they have a huge fight about it. And as this, he goes off to Madrid, to the capital city, to pursue his dream. Well, after a little time, his father, desperate to reconcile with his son, follows him to Madrid, and he ends up putting an ad in the local paper with a simple phrase. Dear Paco, meet me in front of the Madrid newspaper office tomorrow at noon. All is forgiven. I love you. Hemingway would then write, the next day at noon, in front of the newspaper, there were 800 Pacos, all there seeking forgiveness. You know, I think you, forgiveness is a universal desire of the human heart. We can all think of times when we caused hurt and pain in someone's life and we desired that they would forgive us. Whether it was forgiveness from a parent for disobeying the rules or the forgiveness of a friend for hurting their feelings or the forgiveness of a police officer for maybe going a little bit faster than the speed limit. But if forgiveness is something we all desire, then how come it's so hard for us to forgive others when we're wounded? The teaching series that we are in is called Selfless. And the big idea behind this series is that Jesus was a counter-cultural revolutionary who uh, taught us to be others-oriented instead of self-centered. And so today we're going to look at one of the hardest things that both Jesus and the Apostle Paul, as we'll see, call us to do, and that's forgive one another. Jesus uh, was speaking to Peter, the, uh, soon to be the apostle, in Matthew, the gospel, the first gospel in the New Testament, in chapter 18. And this amazing thing happens. Let's look at this. Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Now, let me just pause right there, because Peter is being actually quite magnanimous at the time, right? He is saying, hey, how many times? Like, what's the limit? And we all have had that, right? We've all had that person that keeps doing something over and over and over. And it's like, how many times do I have to forgive you in order to move on? Like, what's it going to take? How many times? Up to seven times? Peter thinks he's being really generous with this. Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times, or 70 times seven, depending on your translation. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king. So now Jesus starts with a parable. He makes up a story to begin to illustrate the point. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. Now let me pause here. Jesus is not promoting slavery. Jesus is using a, something that was very common that did happen because slavery existed in Jesus' time in order to illustrate the point. Okay, Remember, this is a made-up story. So he met, ordered the wife, the kids, all he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. And just to be reminded, this was a hundred bags of gold, which was worth infinitely more than a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. Oh, the words have come back to haunt him. But he refused. Instead, he went off and he had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. 
When the other servants saw what happened, they were outraged, and they went out and told the master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Jesus brought some really hard truths to us, doesn't he? He says that God the Father punishes us when we don't forgive. His parable illustrates the importance of forgiveness. Why? Because this is Jesus' whole mission, right? His whole purpose. When accused of teaching people about Jesus, the Apostle Peter would even say to the council of religious leaders that the God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. There's a salty little statement right there, right? Peter going, no, no, you killed him. You hung him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior for a reason, for a purpose. What is it? That he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. Jesus' entire death was about forgiving the sins of the God's people. You see, forgiveness is not just one of the themes of the Bible. It's the theme. It's what our whole faith is about. It's not about becoming moral people, although Christianity does teach moral principles. It's not about how to win and how to have your best life ever, although your best life is found in uh, when you walk with Jesus. It's about recognizing our need for a Savior. It's about coming to grips with the reality that sin is too big for us to beat on our own as humans. It's about believing that in sacrificing himself on the cross, Jesus paid the debt of our sins. uh, And he did it so that we could have spiritual life. We've been forgiven by God through faith in Jesus. That's the good news of the gospel. Our whole faith is built on the reality that broken sinners like me and like you are forgiven and made whole through Jesus. And I don't know about you, but I know me. I know the evil thoughts that lurk in my mind, the unholy desires that creep around in my heart in the myriad ways I miss the mark. You see, that's what sin actually means, by the way, to miss the mark. It was a um, term used in arrow in shooting competitions, right? You have a target, and anything that missed the target was a sin. It missed it. So what's the target for our lives? What are we aiming at? What is the standard by which we are judged? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. He's the standard. The way that he loved people. The way that he loved God. The moral perfection that he demonstrated. He's the standard, the perfect son of God. And therefore, when I judge my life next to his, right, I know I miss the mark all the time. How about you? Are you as perfect as Jesus? If not, don't despair. You're just like everyone else. And that's why we preach Jesus, because in him, all of our sins, all the ways we don't measure up, all the ways we disobey God's will, all the ways we miss the mark are forgiven. You see, God wants humanity to experience his forgiveness and then to walk rightly with him. But one of the beautiful things about God is that he also wants more for us. He wants us to make forgiveness a part of our relationships with each other. He wants us to be like him and forgive one another. Paul the Apostle writes this in the book of Ephesians chapter 4. 
Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. I've been watching a bunch of mini videos and stuff on the news. And I keep seeing all these people with anger, with rage in their lives, physically assaulting other people. People who maybe don't wear a mask or people of a different race, people of a different gender. And God calls us to be kind, to be compassionate, to forgive each other. Just as in Christ, God forgave you. You see, when you forgive another person, when they miss the mark, you reflect the nature and the mission of God. You are never more like God than when you forgive another person. I've said that a few times in previous sermons, and I want to say that again, because I think it's a really profound statement that's worth memorizing. You are never more like God than when you forgive another person. Well, what is forgiveness? Well, to understand what Paul means here, I want to look at a couple of words in Greek. And I will be a self-admitting, I am not a big Greek scholar, but Paul wrote the New Testament in Greek, and there's a couple of really interesting things here. The first word that I want us to look at is this word elios, and we translate this word mercy. And I had to include a picture of Judge Judy because this is my grandmother's favorite show on TV. She watches hours of Judge Judy. Well, Elios is mercy, and it brings this idea of leniency on someone who's been declared guilty, like in a court of law, okay? So like you were sentenced or you've been found guilty, but instead of a punishment, they're choosing to let you go. So mercy is about not getting the punishment we deserve, right? That's what elios is. There's another word here I want us to look at, and that's this word, and it's charis. Charis, right? And this is the Greek word we usually translate grace, and it means unmerited favor. And it carries this idea with it uh, of something that we receive that we don't deserve, right? Something that we didn't earn, Right? And it talks about how God now um, comes to us on grace. It is by grace we have been saved through faith. It is the unmerited favor of God upon us that has saved us through our faith. Well, when I look in um, the uh, passage that we looked at earlier in Ephesians chapter 4, um, the word for forgiveness that Paul used there is the word charis. It's the word charis, and it means that forgiveness is more than God choosing not to just punish us for our sins. That forgiveness is actually a, an expression of his unearned favor of us. You know, a lot of people said this, maybe you said this. They say, you know what, that person doesn't deserve my forgiveness. Yeah, you're right. That's the point. Forgiveness is not something you earn. It's not something that somebody deserves. It's something that you give, something you receive. Kind of like a birthday present, right? You don't give or receive a present on, uh, for a birthday because you behaved well. That's not what it's for. It's not, hey, you did really well. Here's a birthday present. You got one because someone loved you enough to celebrate that day with you. Forgiveness is the same thing. You give and receive forgiveness not based on what you do, but based on the love of Jesus who forgives you and I. So with that understanding, what does it actually mean to forgive somebody? Rick Love, in his book, Peace Catalyst, Resolving Conflict in Families, Organizations, and Communities, says that in its simplest term, to forgive is to surrender our right to get even. Practically, it involves four promises. It says this, one, I will no longer dwell on this incident. I'm no longer going to bring into my mind the thing that happened over and over and over again so that I can't move on. I'm going to stop thinking about it. I'm going to train my mind to put that and forget about that incident. That's the first way that we will uh, begin to forgive. 
Second thing, I will not bring up this incident again or use it against you. I dare say there's probably a lot of marriages that could be saved if once a situation happened and apologies were made, forgiveness was happened, a relationship was restored, that you stopped bringing it up. Oh, remember when you did that? All you're doing is trying to put, put the other person down when you say, do you remember when you did that? That's just trying to hurt somebody to make yourself feel better. No, no, no. True forgiveness means you don't bring this incident up again. You don't use it against them. With the exception of a pattern of abuse that needs to be addressed. We're talking about true forgiveness here. Number three, I will not talk to others about this incident. Sometimes we begin to talk about this with other people and it begins to stir it back up in us. Can you believe what this person did? Can you believe what that person did? Right? And it begins to stir up this thing and we refuse to let it go and let it die. And we end up ruining other people's reputations because we're continuing to talk about this incident that we so-called forgave them. So if you really want to forgive somebody, don't dwell on it. Don't bring it up again and use it against them. Don't talk to others about it. And finally, don't allow the incident to stand as a barrier or to hinder the relationship. Don't let it be, do that. Don't let it break it. But again, I just want to pause for a moment and just take a minute and tell you something that forgiveness is not. You see, forgiveness is not continuing to place yourself at risk. A lot of the time, the things that we need to do uh, forgiveness for are pretty small things. They're minor things. And relationships can and should be restored. But some offenses aren't like that. Some of you may have experienced trauma and abuse at the result of the actions and the choices of others. And I'm sorry that you had to go through that. I'm sorry that you had to endure the pain and that you continue to bear the burden as it's alive in your life. And while I believe that forgiving those who hurt you is necessary and is important for you, I want to be clear that forgiveness does not mean you give person, a person permission to hurt you again. That's not what it is. Forgiveness and restoration are two different things. And while we always are to forgive... We don't always have to restore the relationship because sometimes it's not wise to. Sometimes it's not safe to. But we should be people who forgive generously. But why? Why should we forgive other people, right? right? Most of us will find uh, the reason of, because Jesus said so, true, and it, maybe it should be enough, but it feels insufficient because we are motivated better by answering the question of why. So here's three reasons why we should forgive others. The first one is this. We should forgive others for our sake. For our sake. You see, forgiveness is first and foremost an internal choice. Before it's anything relational with anyone else, it is a mental and spiritual battle within us to release somebody from their guilt. Harboring bitterness against someone for the way that they hurt you, right, not only um, perpetuates the problem, it keeps hurting you. You're the victim of your own bitterness. You end up letting the person and the situation continue to hurt you over and over and over again. You know, when we ignore a wound, when we suppress the anger that we feel, we end up hurting mostly ourselves. Kind of like when we gash our leg. I've been watching this show on Amazon Prime recently called The World's Toughest Race. Uh, 66 teams raced through the Fiji wilderness in a grueling eco-adventure that left them emotionally and physically depleted. They had to travel over 600 miles by foot, paddleboard, bicycle, and outrigger. It was crazy. And one guy uh, from one of the teams, he fell against some rocks when having to do a rope climb up a thousand foot waterfall. And he gashed his shin really badly. Well, what he did is he slapped a little band-aid on it, sucked it up, and kept going. But what happened is soon an infection set in and his leg swelled. And pretty soon he couldn't even stand up or put any weight on it. 
He had to be evacuated by helicopter to the hospital so he wouldn't lose his leg, and his whole team was then out of the race. You know, when we don't address our wounds, our emotional and spiritual infection can take place, robbing us of our ability to stand properly with Jesus and move forward in the race to which he has called us. You see, forgiveness is the antibiotic that allows healing to take place in those wounds. So I wonder, how many of you have been wounded by someone and it's held you back in life. I wonder how many of you are currently living with an emotional and spiritual infection from wounds inflicted in the past. The Lord our God is inviting you to experience healing through forgiveness. So we should forgive others for our sake, but we should also forgive others for their sake. See, our call to forgive is rooted in God's forgiveness of us. So when we are choosing to forgive, we are revealing the work of God in our lives. Unlike the servant in the parable that we looked at earlier, who got forgiveness from the master but wouldn't pass it on, right? we testify that we are forgiven And therefore, we forgive others. We offer it as well. We refuse to hold back from anyone that which God offers to each of us. Pastor Chuck Swindoll tells the story of a young man in seminary who got a job driving a bus on Chicago's south side. One day, a gang of youth, of teens, uh, they were kind of brutal. They got on board and they refused to pay the fare. Well, after a few days of this, the seminarian spotted a policeman on the corner, stopped the bus, and reported them. The officer made them pay, but then he went and got off the bus. Well, what happened? The bus went around the corner, out of sight of the police officer. The gang went up and robbed the seminary student and beat him severely. Well, he pressed charges. The gang was rounded up. They were found. They were found guilty in a court. But as soon as the jail sentence was given, the young Christian saw their spiritual need of these teenagers, and he felt pity for them. So he paused, and he actually put his hand up, and he asked the judge if he could serve their sentences for them. The judge was confused. The gang members were dumbfounded. They asked him why. And he goes, it's because I forgive you, he explained. His request was denied, but he ended up going and visiting these young men in jail. He ended up leading several of them to faith in Christ. You see, when we offer forgiveness to people, we reveal to that person that God loves them. Not based on how good they are, but based on how good he is. And as ambassadors of God, when we forgive someone, we might just be the conduits that God uses to bring forgiveness into a person's life so they could be healed. Forgiveness is a way to reveal God to people because after all, you're never more like God than when you forgive someone. So, you know, we forgive others for our sake so that we can experience healing. We should forgive others for their sake as a witness, as a means of revealing God to them. But also, we should forgive others for God's sake. If I've got a problem with someone else, what does God have to do with that? Well, everything. You know, talked about this verse last week. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says this, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them, then come offer your gift. You see, the heart of this teaching from Jesus is that God cares more about how we treat each other, especially whether or not we forgive each other, than he does about our offerings, about our gifts or our service. You see, your worship of God is tainted if you keep bitterness and resentment against another person in your heart. 
Look at what um, the Apostle John writes in one of his letters. He says, Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister, whom they've seen, cannot love God, whom they have not seen. This is a verse that shows us you cannot be a Christian racist. It is not possible because you can't hate people and love God. And you can't be a bitter and unforgiving Christian because you cannot know God and love God and hate the people that he created, whom he loved, who he died for. So forgiving is actually an act of worship. When we choose to act in a way that brings glory to God in response to God, that's what worship is. So we recognize that God's forgiven us, and then we respond by forgiving others. And when we do so, we're actually worshiping our God and bringing Him glory. If I'm trying to teach my daughter to be loving, and I do that by showing her love, you know, buying her presents and taking her to the movies and getting her chicken nuggets, then she might come back to me and say, oh, she loves me. And I'll tell you, it makes me feel good when we do that. But if I see her turn around and love someone else, well, now I'm in a whole different ballgame. Because then she's internalized what I'm attempting to teach her. And she's honored me greater than if she just simply tells me that she loves me. You see, when we forgive somebody, we're demonstrating we've internalized our own forgiveness by God. And that blesses God's heart. And whatever we do that blesses God's heart is worship. We should forgive others for our sake because it heals us. We should forgive others for their sake because it's a witness to the love of God. And we should forgive others for God's sake, as an act of worship to him who allowed his son Jesus to die on my behalf and on your behalf so that we could be forgiven. We all get wounded by people in our life. Sometimes it's our friends. Sometimes it's our families. Sometimes it's our churches. But the way of Christ is the way of forgiveness. And we are called, actually, we are commanded to forgive one another, just as we were forgiven in Christ. Is there somebody that you need to forgive? Today is the day. Remember what Jesus did for you. Remember that Jesus died for them to forgive them as well, and reach out with forgiveness. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you first and foremost that you forgive us for all of our mistakes, all the ways that we sin and we miss the mark. You forgive us for all of them, for our whole lives. And you did it by this, through the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ, who gives us eternal life when we put our faith in him. I thank you for that forgiveness. I'm reminded of it every time I sin and I bring it before you and I renew my worship before you. I thank you, Lord God, too, that you call us to become like you, that you call us to forgive like you forgave us. But God, we have to confess it's hard. We've got to, forget, for, we've got to confess, Lord, that there is a lot of pain. There's a lot of wounding. There is, for some of us, an infection of bitterness, of resentment, of rage that lies deep within us. And we need the antibiotic. Administered by your Holy Spirit, the antibiotic of forgiveness. So I pray that through the Holy Spirit, you would empower us to make the choice to forgive them, no matter what they did, no matter how horrible it was. Give us the courage to find healing through forgiveness. And if it's possible, if it's right, show us how to be reconciled. Although we know it's not always that way. God, you are good. I know how much you in particular care about unity in your churches. So if there's something between Christians, would you cause reconciliation and forgiveness to flow? May we learn to be quick to forgive 
quick to move on together for your glory. We pray these things in your name. And all God's people said, Amen.